Good morning, everyone. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord together this morning? Amen. I'm so glad to see you all here today, and it is with great joy that we welcome back Pastor Steve and Martha this morning. Would you all just join me in welcoming them? I know that they are so grateful for all of your prayers, and I'll just ask that you continue to hold them in your prayers as he continues to heal, but he is here to offer the children's wiggle time in the sermon this morning, so so glad to have you home, (laughs) truly home, and so happy to see all of you here today. I hope that you will open your hearts and open your ears and let the Holy Spirit work in you this morning. Let the worship begin. Gracious and loving creator, we come today in summer joy. 
We come to celebrate your love in our midst. We come together in these moments of worship, secure and assured of your forgiveness and truth, your salvation and joy, your sustaining love, and your captivating will. Yet in these moments, we know too and confess our weakness, our faltering faith, and our remorseful lives. Lead us, great God, in faith through the hours and days ahead. In joy and hope, let us worship the God of love. Would you please stand and join us in the hymn of praise, Lift High the Cross. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this day with so many things going on in our lives. Some of these things are wonderful and cause us to rejoice. And there are many things that cause us fear and anxiety. Humbly, we wait for your presence with us. Remind us again of your everlasting love and grace. We need your healing touch. Feed us with the bread of life that we may hunger no more. Strengthen us to do your will, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you'd like to be seated, you can join us in the choral call to affirmation, verse 6 of For the Beauty of the Earth. Join me in the affirmation of faith from the Methodist hymnal number 887. You'll respond with a bold-faced print. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. 
we are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. And with the confidence of the children of God, would you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our response is verse 2 of Be Thou My Vision. Doesn't it feel like things are just getting a little bit more back to normal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feels so good. And on that note, it's time for Wiggle Time with Pastor Steve. Good morning, campers. Man, oh man, I guess, I'm sure you're wondering, where have you been all summer? Well, <laughs> well it has been quite, quite a summer for me this summer. Um, I had to go to the hospital a couple of times this summer, and, um, but I'm, I'm getting better. And the reason I'm getting better is because I've had wonderful people take care of me. You know, when you're in the hospital, there's, there's a lot of people. <laughs> and I usually kept my door closed if I could, just so the noise of the hall wouldn't come into my room and interrupt my sleeping, because you try to nap every chance you get. Uh, but that doesn't happen a whole lot in the hospital, because there's all kinds of people coming in to check on you. There's somebody that comes in and, and empties your trash cans and makes sure your room's clean. Well, that wakes you up. <laughs> There's, there's somebody that comes in and, and checks your blood pressure, and they check your temperature, and they make sure you've got enough oxygen in your blood, and, and they, they check on you for that, and then somebody wants to come in and do something else, and then come, someone wants to come in and talk to you, and they want to come in and ask you questions, and all these people are checking on you to make sure that you're doing okay. Well... I'm very grateful that there were people that checked on me because, well, I'm back with you, my church family today, back with my wigglers for wiggle time, and, and, uh, and back where I ought to be, and I'm feeling better because of people caring. Now, some people might say that, well, those are nurses and those are doctors, and that's their job, and they get paid to do that. 
well, yeah, you're right. That is their job. But as I think about it, that's our job too. To check on each other. To make sure that each other's okay. To see if anybody needs anything. You know, you, you don't have to be an adult. You don't have to be uh, a professional. We can still check. And it's important to do that. I think that's what Jesus wants us to do. Is to make sure that other people are okay. Just like we make sure that we ourselves are okay. You know, I found a, a, a one-minute video that I wanted to share with you this morning about a little boy. There's, I don't think there's any spoken words in it at all, but it's a video about a little boy who didn't have lunch at school and watch what his classmates do for him because they checked on him to make sure that he would be okay. Okay. <laughs> Actually, this is a video about a down a dancing mouse. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> and uh, Well, it tries to go, but it just won't. We'll try one more time. Push piece of it. I don't know what those words mean right there, but I think if I were going to say it was taking care of each other, L looking around and seeing if there is someone around us who has a need and doing what we can. That whole class pitched in with a grape or two or a carrot stick or two or a piece of bread, and that little boy that had an empty lunchbox had a full lunchbox and a full tummy because someone cared, someone checked on him, someone cared. You know, Wigglers, God calls us to have an open eye, to look around and see about those who might need a helping hand. The truth is, when we offer a helping hand, we offer the hand of Jesus to people when they need it. Those helping hands, however big, however small, as small as a grape or a carrot stick, can truly share the love of Jesus with other people. Let's pray. Oh God, give us your eyes to see the needs of others. Pour your blessings, O oh Lord, upon all my kids. Uh, continue, O oh Lord, to give them a good summer, and as they prepare for school, uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that they're safe, and they have an incredible school gear. 
some of our big wigglers now are getting ready to begin their college years. We pray, O oh Lord, a special blessing as they take their steps into this fall semester. Bless them. Keep them safe, O oh Lord. Help them to know that we pray for them every day. Help all my wigglers to know, O oh God, that we pray for them day after day. Give us your eyes, O oh Lord, to see when others need a helping hand from you, and let us be that helping hand. Amen. that sought my heart on that first day be the grace that binds my heart to stay may the truth that opened up my eyes on that first time be the thoughts on my mind that never go away For you are a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You're the hand that's holding me, faithful God. Every promise kept. my heart to set it free be the love that others see in me and may this hope that reaches to the depths of human need be the song that I sing in joy and suffering for you are the love that never leaves, the friend that won't deceive. You're the one true thing, faithful God. mine, oh love, that will not let me go. How deep, how wide the love that pierced his side, the love, redemption's mine, oh love, that will not let me go.
summer seriously this year. <laughs> Before I start this morning, I need to say thank you to all of you. Uh, all of you for carrying on and, and, and keeping the church rolling. And uh, I learned a very valuable lesson. It's not about me. <laughs> it's about you and all the others around. So, thank you. Over the past weeks, I've had some time to free associate. Uh, that's psychology's way of saying that over the past weeks, I've given myself permission uh, to let my thoughts wander and to remember. I've thought about my family. I've thought about cherished friends. I've thought about the church as the Red Cross for the human heart. I've thought about our church. Churches from my past, the church I grew up in and also churches that have been former appointments. I remembered some of the tales from my past, some of the great memories, some not so great. I've thought about those who have shared the journey with me, many persons I'll never forget, some who have always been with me, and some who have shared the journey and then faded away. But oh, the faces I've seen as I let my mind free associate. Several of those faces, if I could, uh, I would go back to the moments we shared uh, over and over over again just to experience that love again and to pay tribute to those treasured persons and extraordinary fellow sojourners I don't ever want to forget. In my life, love has had so many faces. Have you ever given yourself permission to free associate, to remember the faces and even relive the love those faces represent. I resist in doing this, but I need to give you a really quick Greek word study. The ancient Greeks had six words for love. There are three words for love in biblical Greek. The first word is eros. It's romantic love. That's pretty easy to define. Uh, one is philei or philea. Uh, that's like brotherly love, family love. Uh, Philadelphia comes from the word uh, philea. And then there's the word agape. That means the parental love of God for humans and, and the human love for another, a, a sacrificial, unselfish love that seeks the good and well-being of others and of the neighborhood and of the world. Agape is the love that looks outwardly. Agape is a firm commitment to act for the well-being of someone other than ourselves. Do you, do you remember the old hymn, At the Cross? <laughs> it's a different name now in the United Methodist Hymnal. Uh, when I grew up, it was At the Cross. But one of the verses from that song says, but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. It's love in motion. Love as an action. 
And it's the only thing that has ever changed the world for the better. One face of love is Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer, who was honored on the floor of the House of Representatives in 2017 on the 100th anniversary of her birth. Fannie was one of, get this, Fannie was one of 20 children. Her parents were slaves who were desperately poor. Fanny had polio, but walking with a limp didn't stop her from picking cotton. She dropped out of school to help her aging parents pick even more cotton because that's what a sister does when the family has 19 other children to feed. In 1961, Fanny went to the county hospital for minor surgery and was sterilized without her consent. She could have given up at that point, deciding that any society that would condone such a crime uh, was evil, but not Fanny. Because one year later, she discovered that black people had the right to register and vote, but she failed the literacy test and was denied her right to register and vote. And after that day, she never tired in her fight to right that wrong. She survived a KKK gunshot. The police imprisoned her and beat her, but despite her experiences, she never once back down from the vision of the civil rights movement that had as its conclusion all good people living together as sisters and brothers sharing at the same welcoming table. That's a face of love. The agape love of Fannie Lou Hamer. That's a love that cannot be segregated to the private, personal walls and boundaries of our lives. Love, as the Bible has it, affects every aspect of human life. It's found everywhere. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son. The world loved, the word loved that St. John uses is agape. And the word John uses for word is cosmos. That means everything, everything that is. Uh, do, do you remember singing in Sunday school or vacation Bible school or with a youth group around a campfire that old spiritual, he's got the whole world in his hands. God so loved the world that God gave Jesus. Church, that's the very love that draws us to the heart of God. That's the very love that draws us to the heart of each other. It's the pathway to the world that God intends for us and all creation, a love that's so strong that it moves the sun and the stars and a stubborn, selfish humanity. It's the pathway that returns the sense of awe and reverence that has departed many of our churches. As I understand it, love is the rule for living. Paul wrote some extraordinary words in 1 Corinthians 13 about the way of love and living a life of love. He writes, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Paul gets it. (laughs) He's trying to help the Corinthians remember what the face of love looks like. But it's easy for us to miss it, maybe because we have a limited use of love. You see, when Paul wrote these words about love, it wasn't for a wedding or a funeral or some other special event where we might read Scripture. No, Paul expresses love so powerfully because he was really upset. He wrote those words in a letter to a church in a Greek seaport named Corinth where he had founded a community of faith, a church around the teachings of Jesus. And he had heard some disappointing news out of that church. I guess the community members had forgotten all those values that had brought them together, and they were really, really tearing each other apart. I guess you could say that they had lost the love. (laughs) They had forgotten what the face of love looks like. And Paul says that people were fighting in the pews at the church, splitting into cliques according to who had baptized them. People were suing each other. They were stepping outside the bonds of their marriages. They were sleeping around the well-to-do and the elitists. We're demanding that they get communion first. People were getting drunk at communion. Some had turned the sacrament of communion into covered dish dinners, ignoring those who had no food to eat. They were arguing about who is the better Christian, who was going to heaven and who was not. This had become a pretty dysfunctional community of faith. Paul couldn't imagine a church, followers of Jesus, being so divided. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? The situation at Corinth that caused Paul to write this letter sounds a bit contemporary. Despite Jesus' farewell prayer that we be one as Jesus and the Father are one, there is division and disunity that remains. Rude arrogance insisting on its own way irritable, resentful, rejoicing in wrongdoing. Paul gets it. Paul gets it. He remembers what the face of love looks like, which is a good thing because sometimes we forget. As one of my seminary professors challenged the seminary while preaching, she said, what part of love one another do we not understand? Love your neighbors, she said. The church at Corinth had lost the sense of love for each other, but for Paul and and even the disciples, the face of love was a gift 
of the self to others. Love is the rule for living. I believe that even though Paul wrote these great words of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul was furious with the church at Corinth. The very people who were supposed to be the holy people of Jesus Christ together with followers of Jesus everywhere. So he writes to them with his best response, offering the only cure he sees for the mess that they've gotten themselves into. The cure, the answer, is love. It's the only thing left to save a community that was so divided. I've learned that we might think that the opposite of love is hate. But love's opposite is not hate. It's selfishness. A life that's completely centered on the self, as if the whole university universe, as if the whole universe so revolves around ourselves. And when that happens, we're living a lie because no amount of smarts or money or prestige or status or even accomplishments put any one human at the center of existence. Selfishness is the destructive force. Hate is only its symptom. The love that Paul is desperately reaching to the Corinthian church is something fierce. The, the, this, love, it, this love is a verb, an action with force and follow-through. This love, when it's in action, reveals its extraordinary power and is the only thing that ever changed the world for the better. Love is a firefighter running into a burning building to save people she or he doesn't even know. Love is a first responder speeding toward an emergency, a catastrophe, or a disaster. Love is protecting one another and caring for another during a pandemic. Love is someone protesting anything that hurts or harms the children of God. Jesus said it just hours before his crucifixion. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's own life for one's friends. Love is a commitment that makes another's welfare as important to us as our own welfare. Love is sharing your lunch with someone who has no lunch. Love doesn't stop at our front door or our neighborhood or our religion or our denomination or our race or our borders. Love calls us to sacrifice because it's the right thing to do. Paul reminds the Corinthian church what love looks like. And then he finishes what we call the love chapter with these words. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Paul gets it. He clearly recognizes the face of love. To live full lives together, we need faith and hope and love. Faith is another word for trust. Without trust, we fall apart. Relationships are impossible. Without trust, it's every man for himself. And, and that's a mess. 
Faith is an act of trust, daring to live for and towards something, even if you can't see its end. One of my favorite anthems has very simple lyrics that are such a rich affirmation of faith. The words were written by a Jew in Cologne, Germany, during World War II, where the text was found scratched onto a wall. He writes, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I feel it not. I believe in God even when he is silent. If we dare to live life based on faith, we likely will be living a life contrary to what the evidence presents and almost assuredly against popular opinion. Faith calls us to believe that in the end, love wins. We can't see it, but we believe it anyway. Faith has a partner, hope. Hope comes along and puts the wind in our sails of faith. Hope is the energy that keeps us going. Life comes at us at full force. It is hope that tells you that if you're going through hell, keep going. but it's the task of love that tells us what to do. Love asks us the question, is this just about me or is it about we? Does this decision serve only me or does it somehow serve the greater good? And if the answer is me and only me, the face of love says, stop. It really is that simple. Me or we. If it's only about me, there's no room for you. And and if everyone lives that way, there'll be no room for any of us. Paul gets it. This is what love is about. Love makes room. Love includes. Love lifts up. It helps. Love heals. The face of love will show us the right thing to do every time. Love is our place of rest in the midst of the chaos that is often a part of our lives. Love is how we stay decent in indecent times. And love gets stronger with repetition. Love works. Paul got it. Paul had seen the face of love in the face of the Lord Jesus, and it changed him forever. Paul wanted the church at Corinth to get it, to rediscover what the face of love, the love and grace of Jesus Christ can do to the human heart. And my prayer is that just like Paul got it, I pray we get it too. Amen.
Education, Hope of the World, verses 1, 3, and 4. Go forth and live as clear reflections of Jesus Christ in the world. Speak and live in love with integrity as you journey through this new week, knowing that God will supply your every need and lead you to everlasting life. Amen. <laughs> 